Hello and welcome. UVA Speaks is a podcast of Lifetime Learning, a division of the Office of Engagement at the University of Virginia. Lifetime Learning brings the knowledge and expertise of UVA's faculty to the university's alumni, friends, and families. My name is Susan Lynch, and I am the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. This podcast features Dr. Tyson Bell. Dr. Bell is an Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Divisions of Infectious Diseases and International Health and Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at UVA. He's also the Director of the Medical Intensive Care Unit and Director of the UVA Summer Medical Leadership Program. Dr. Bell's interests include improving inpatient healthcare delivery through quality improvement initiatives and increasing workforce diversity. He's also involved in quality improvement efforts on the national level and sits on the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Committee, developing healthcare payment reform initiatives. In this podcast, Dr. Bell will talk with us about heart attacks and cardiac arrests. We are recording this podcast a few weeks after the sudden cardiac arrest of Damar Hamlin, an NFL football player who collapsed after a hit as thousands were watching live on national television, and his case has brought the issue into public conversation. So Dr. Bell will talk with us about these conditions, what we need to know to increase our odds of surviving one of these episodes, and how bystanders can assist in an emergency. So thank you, Dr. Bell, for speaking with me today about this very important topic. Thank you for having me, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here speaking with you. Okay, great. Thank you. So first, can you explain the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest? That's a very good question. Uh, Now, the two can be related, but they really are two separate things. So first, I think we should just start with the basics. The heart is basically a pump that uses electrical signals to operate and pump blood through the body. The blood has oxygen in it, which your body depends on to live. Now, the heart is an organ, too. So in addition to pumping blood out of itself to get the rest of the body, it also gives blood and oxygen back to itself as it pumps. So you can think of a heart attack as a problem with the pipes in the heart itself. A blockage could lead to less oxygen that the heart gets, and that can lead to damage in the heart. And that's uh, why some people may describe having chest pain, for instance, if they have a heart attack, because the um, heart's pain might actually refer to uh, the chest or the arm. And sometimes the blockage can be so bad that it can interfere with the electrical signal that the heart uses to pump. And if that happens, you could actually have a heart attack that leads to a cardiac arrest, but they are separate. There are a bunch of different uh, conditions that can lead to the heart stopping and the electrical signals being jumbled. Heart attack is just one of them. Great. Thank you for that distinction, because I have to say uh, I wasn't sure that there was a distinction. So that that's really very helpful. You know, so in the case of Damar Hamlin, that was a cardiac arrest, uh, meaning that his heart had stopped beating. And given the circumstances of his situation, you know, Mr. Hamlin received medical attention from highly trained medical professionals within seconds. And how important is it for someone to receive attention as quickly as possible? Oh, it's very important. And, And I would say it's actually one of the most important things. So when a patient collapses uh, outside of the hospital, and that's what happened with Mr. Hamblin, it is very important that they receive good quality chest compressions right away, and we try to restart the heart as quickly as possible. When we have patients come in from uh, into the emergency room and into the intensive care unit where I work, we always want to know how long were they down and how long did it take for them to get the heart restarted and how good were chest compressions in between. And we know that if chest compressions were started right away, they were good quality and we got the heart restarted in a, a reasonable amount of time there's a good chance that that patient may actually have a good recovery. And so I wasn't watching the football game. I had heard about it shortly after, but I understood at the time that Mr. Hamlin collapsed on the field. He got medical attention right away. He's also relatively healthy. He's a you know high-performing athlete. And I think, you know, of course, you don't want to say anything out loud if you're not the doctor at the bedside, but I think myself and many others who kind of do this for a living probably understood that, you know, certainly looks bad, but if he got medical attention right away and got chest compressions, he's likely going to make a pretty good recovery. And, and thank goodness, that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when something like this happens, um, you know, as you're saying, we are reliant upon those around us and we may not have a medical professional on hand to intervene. So how important is it for all of us to learn CPR? 
I think CPR is a very important skill for people to learn. I wouldn't say all people. Uh, if you've done CPR before, it, it takes a lot of physical effort. And, you know, I'm aware that, you know, there are some people who may not be able to to physically do it. And, and in that case, it might be good for that person to go get EMS or, or act, activate emergency response, for instance. Uh, but it is very important that if someone collapses, especially if their heart stops, that they get CPR right away. Uh, now, one thing that the AHA, the American Heart Asso Association, did in their bystander CPR algorithm was actually take out mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. They actually found that uh, that made people very anxious, um, and especially nowadays, thinking about giving mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to someone uh, with all the viruses circulating around and you don't know the, the other person, it became a barrier to actually giving CPR. But CPR is actually the most important thing to deliver. I think one thing to mention is uh, just how much oxygen the body has on reserve. So at any given moment, uh, the body only uses about a quarter of the oxygen available to it in the blood. And so that means if the heart stops, and even if that person doesn't get any more oxygen into their lungs, if you can do chest compressions and help the heart circulate the blood through the body, you can actually get oxygen circulating for a while, certainly long enough until you can have medical professionals arrive and try to get the heart restarted. But it is very crucial that we have more people that are aware and understand how to do CPR um, in the proper way to do it. So in the bystander algorithm, uh, it's, it's pretty easy. You can just remember the rule of twos. You want to do compressions, two minute cycles. You want to try to get a defibrillator uh, at the, at the patient's side. And then you want to compress the chest about two inches or so. So two inches every two minutes. And, uh, and we, this is a crude joke, but we use a song, the Bee Gees staying alive mm -hmm. as a kind of the tempo for how quick the chest compressions to be. You want them to be about a hundred to 120 compressions per minute. Uh, the beats per minute of that song is 104. So you kind of have that going in your head as you're doing the compressions. Okay, great. So sort of as a follow-up to that, I I've been trained on CPR several times. Um, however, I still feel uncomfortable and I'm really not confident that I would be able to effectively intervene because I'm afraid I will cause more harm. And is that a valid concern? And then it also, how often should we go back to get CPR training? That's a good, that's a really good question because, uh, you know, my training evolved on this, you know, at one point I was a, a, a medical student, a new doctor. And now that I've done this, I have a very different approach. But one thing I always tell people is that if someone collapses in front of you, and their heart stops, they have died. They have medically died. And so it is very hard for you to do something at that point then that makes it worse than it already is. Most of the things that you can do are gonna be things that help. And so CPR is definitely one of those. And, and I would encourage people to, to learn about it, get a comfort level with it. Uh, let's be honest, if this happens in front of you, you're not going to step in like you're in the movies and I've got this under control. Let's do chest compressions. I think even I, you know, someone who does this on a daily basis, I would be nervous if, if this happened. So let's normalize that. First of all, you're not going to feel like a hero. You're going to feel very nervous in this situation. But what's still important is that uh, you uh, stick with the rule of twos, get the chest compressions, have someone call EMS. That's what's really important. As far as the CPR training, uh, the the recommended time frame is every two years. So if you get certified every two years, you should go and recertify. And my experience is that over time, if you keep up with it, after you've done it two or three times of training, even if you haven't used it, you know, luckily, you know, this is something that we gain the skill and we hope to never have to use it. But after you've done two or three different trainings, to, you know, we start to come back to you, you start to remember certain things and it becomes a little more easier to remember. And they've certainly started to make the algorithm more simple over time, which is also very good. And so uh, I would say get familiar with it, you know, look in the CPR training in your neighborhood, uh, be prepared for that moment, realize that it, you're, you're still going to be very nervous, but it, it's okay because there's, like I said before, there's very little things that you can do in that situation that cause more harm. Yeah, I think that I've been thinking about that uh, since the DeMar Hamlin case is that this person is already down. And I need to just do something, you know, is mm -hmm. what I would be trying to tell myself at that point. Um, so how important are defibrillators? Um, sort of what do they do? 
And should we be checking out our workplaces and other places that we frequent, like churches, synagogues, mosques, um, and places that we attend often to see if there are defibrillators around? Yes, defibrillators are very important, and I, I wish they were more widely available. They are starting to increase in, in, um, in how widespread they are. But their job is basically to reset the heart. They use electricity and they kind of deliver a jolt at the right time uh, to try to get the heart restarted. And that's very crucial when we're trying to help someone recover and get the heart restarted. Like we said, the CPR is very important, but there is a, a time frame in which you know that uh, is not going to work if we can't get the heart restarted. And so having an AED available is uh, is very good. They also they're simple to use. They are different manufacturers, but they all stick with the very same core function. It's a uh, it's uh, audio clue, so it tells you exactly what to do. It shows you where to place pads, etc. It lets you know when you should do CPR, when you should give a shock, make sure that everyone's clear. Uh, so they're they're very useful. Um, this is just, you know, it's a habit of mine. This is what I do. So when I go into a building that I'm unfamiliar with, I do look around and try to locate where the AEDs are so I can kind of know, um, you know, where to send someone or if I get it myself, I kind of know. Uh, but it is something that's a, it's a good habit. Um, so if you're, you know, on the airport in a, in a, in a, in a building and a hospital for, you know, for instance, in a waiting room, it's just good to know where they are. Great. Thank you. Um, just sort of a follow up. I'm, I'm looking at some information and it, and it is saying that survival rates could double or triple if more people take action and know what to do when someone is in a sudden cardiac arrest. Can, can you speak to those stats and really why it's just so vitally important? Yes, it's very important because time is very limited when it comes to someone who suffers a cardiac arrest. Um, even if we're able to get the heart restarted, uh, the one of the most crucial organs is the brain. And, and if uh, the brain uh, runs out of oxygen, then that can be very devastating. Even if your other organs, which have a little bit more resilience, can recover, you could have a patient whose heart function recovers, but they have no neurological function and no awareness that um, anyone is in the room or they can't hear or anything. And, and that's a situation um, that's, you know, it could be considered brain dead or a vegetative state. Uh, so it is very important. Um, I think the more that we talk about this and use opportunities to educate the community, get people comfortable with it, I think the better off we'll be as a society because bystander CPR, like I said earlier, is one of the most important factors when it comes to getting people through this. Thank you. And I was thinking about it recently as the bystander issue. I mean, I've been trained for bystander training for violence prevention, um, you know, because I used to work in, in uh, a domestic violence situation. And so this helped me frame it a little bit differently as a bystander issue. So I appreciate that. And so before getting to my last question, is there anything else that you would like to mention to sort of round out our discussion uh, for folks? Yes, there is actually. And I called some attention to this a few weeks ago in, in that uh, we have a disparity when it comes to rates of CPR delivery. And there are many different reasons related to it. But there is a study released recently that showed that if you were Black or Hispanic, you were less likely to receive CPR both in your own community and when you're out in public. And like I said, there are many different reasons why, but I think one of them might be related to education about CPR, the availability of classes. Sometimes they, they can be a financial burden, uh, but it's something that we have to tackle and we have to find ways to increase uh, community awareness of CPR, the importance of CPR so that you know, if anyone collapses anywhere, no matter you know where they come from or what they look like, they have a chance to make it because there are people around them who can respond to them. And so we are looking at efforts to try to educate the community. One thing that we're looking at is, is uh, going into a couple of community groups that are around Charlottesville and Albemarle and doing some of this basic CPR training so that people have some awareness. Um, if there's any good that came out of this uh, situation with Mr. Hamlin is that there is attention focus on this issue. And so we can use that as a moment to increase awareness and education. Hopefully that can lead to lives saved. Great. Thank you. That's a, that's an important uh, issue. And I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. So and finally, you mentioned that you have a podcast. And can you tell us about your podcast and where our listeners can find it? 
Well, thank you. So uh, my <laughs> podcast is uh, focused on the Department of Medicine at the University of Virginia. And this was just my experiment to do something a little different. This was my first major career change coming out of COVID-19. And, um, and I wanted to try something that was a little, little creative. My wife is actually a singer and I've seen how her creative side is, can really be therapeutic. And so I still provide patient care, but the podcast was a way for me to get to know people, to connect with, with folks and to tell stories fundamentally. And so you can find it on This Medicine Life uh, with uh, Dr. Tyson Bell. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. And we talk about various issues. They tend to be focused on faculty development for academic physicians, but I do have a couple of fun stories in there, including uh, one perilous trip I took to Egypt recently. <laughs> I was listening to the one that you did with your colleague who was from Ukraine, and that was that was very interesting. Yes, that was very en enlightening. And, and one of the ways that, you know, we... we we have so many interesting stories around us, right? But sometimes we either don't know or we're not aware. And what I wanted to do was create a way to connect with each other so that we could learn each other's stories so that the next time you see that person, you might you know, have some insight into what, what they've gone through and, and have a, a better conversation and a deeper relationship. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bell, um, for sharing all of this information. As I said, this is an issue that many of us have been thinking about lately, as you mentioned that as well. And I appreciate you explaining the medical aspects of these conditions and helping break down how we can prepare if we are faced with needing help ourselves or assisting others. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with UVA's alumni, friends, and families. Thank you. And thank you for listening for upcoming podcasts and other lifetime learning programming, recordings, and blogs. Please visit our website at engagement.virginia.edu forward slash learn. You can also find our podcasts on Spotify and with the Virginia Audio Collective, which is a network of UVA podcasts hosted by WTJU Radio and can be found at virginiaaudio.org. So thanks again, and we look forward to you taking part in future lifetime learning programs.